Welcome back to Daybreak. I'm Victoria Rubadiri. Still have my panelists in studio with me. To my far left, we have Soipan Otuya, the Narok Women Representative. We also have Wanja Maina, Development Specialist and Chair of the Jubilee Party's PWD's League. And we have Anne Ireri, Chair of ELOG and FIDA Executive Director. Um, you know, so Wanja, you kind of um, got us ready for this part of the conversation in terms of Things being clear, uh, laws being clear, stipulations being clear uh, to level the playing field, if you will, for women um, in, in politics. Um, but Soipan, let me let me start with you because you were in the thick of it. Yes. A few weeks ago during the primaries um, and, and seeking a seat in your county. You know the inner workings of the political parties. And you yeah. said during the break that it starts with the political parties. Yes. Take us through your experience and, and just what you've seen and learned uh, through that encounter. Um, from the lens of a woman in politics, uh, it's a tough field to be in. Mm. Uh, we still have, a, I have served uh, 10 years as a woman's representative. And I must start by saying that, uh, you know, our 2010 constitution is really... Um, comprehensive to the core in terms of uh, trying to address the whole issue about uh, non-discrimination against women in leadership. I am a beneficiary of the affirmative action uh, provisions of our constitution. Um, and I think uh, the only thing we missed is that we need to cap the affirmative action uh, positions because affirmative action cannot go forever, It cannot go on forever. The intention is actually uh, to, uh, you know, it's, it's supposed to be temporary to achieve a certain uh, objective. And I am testimony to the fact that uh, the, the 47 uh, seats set aside for women in our constitution were really the right way to go. I managed to build my muscle even to run for a governor position within 10 years. And uh, un unfortunately, I, I am not... Uh, on the ballot right now. I did not manage to go through the primaries. Um, <clears throat> and I know uh, with the kind of uh, muscle that I've built through the affirmative action position of uh, women representative, I know I will take it to the next level, you know, come uh, the next election. I should be able to, to go back and fight again. Yeah. Um, it is uh, quite an experience. Um, the field out there for women, we still have uh, attacks leveled against women from a personal perspective. Um, you know, um, you have all manner of things said about you. You have all manner of uh, perceptions. Uh, people feeling like the only position that a woman should run for in this country is a woman reps it and nothing else. And when you go for these other positions, it feels like you're grabbing something away from the men politicians, mm. which that shouldn't be, and it shouldn't deter any woman. And I want to actually um, applaud many of our women who have stood out, you know, stood the test of time, and, and we are scaling it up as, as we go. You will realize that uh, even the numbers have kept on growing yeah. within parliament for women who are running in the single member constituency uh, positions. We are having numbers going up of women coming out to take up the position of governors. Uh, we have numbers going up, even women coming up as, as, as deputy governors. So I think uh, that progressive uh, move is, is, is something to watch, but a lot still needs to be done so that, you know, women running for all these positions is normalized so that, uh, you know, we, 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 women will be seen to be actually exercising their rights. It's not favors, you know, it's not a favor for a woman to clinch a ticket to run for president in this country. It's a right, it's entrenched in our constitution. It is doable. Um, I am a member of the Kenya Kwanzaa Alliance. Uh, quite huge strides we have made. Uh, if you look at the landscape right now, the Kenya Kwanzaa Alliance has the highest number of women running for governorship. We have seven of them. We have the highest number of women running for single member constituencies 
a high number of members running for, uh, for member of county assembly. And that tells you that, uh, God willing, comes 9th, we will have more women governors serving, we will have more, more women uh, in the Senate and, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, during the, our party primaries, uh, we went through the, 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 the primaries uh, regulations or the nominations regulations of the UDA party, because I'm a member of the UDA party, had a whole uh, um, system of uh, the primaries, one of which was a, a negotiated democracy, which I went through. We, we did a consensus process and uh, I, I, you know, let somebody else run. Uh, for the governor position. I had an, op an option to go back uh, as woman rep, but I declined because like I've said, um, 10 years is enough for anybody to run for an affirmative action position. Mm -hmm. And we should actually be paving way for other women to take up those positions, to build the muscle and be able to run for, for office. Money is a huge factor. Yes, and we'll get to that. You know? <laughs> we'll, we'll get to that. I want you to just get Wanja's yes. take on, on your uh, recommendation to scrap the affirmative action seats. You know, do you feel we've reached that point now as an electorate to have women uh, vie for the mixed gender seats? And, you know, uh, do you feel that the affirm affirmative action positions have done their job? have run their course in the time that, um, you know. And, and maybe before just Wanja quips in, um, what I mean by capping is for an individual uh, person. Can't go beyond the... Yeah, I think you shouldn't go beyond two terms. Okay, two terms. Yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah, well, I, th I think that's quite interesting because it also speaks into the character of Moshimiwa to be a person who says, actually, let the next... Uh, I think I saw in your Twitter when you said, let the next woman really get that mm. chance. So that tells you really about, uh, you know, the quality of a uh, leader that she is. So that's quite commendable and beautiful. Affirmative action for special interest groups, and that should be in Article 100, uh, it is different for different special interest mm. groups. So you're finding, for example, uh, there are those issues of intersectionality where the, wim the women have really made some strides, but young women are still yet to be seen to sh or to be given an opportunity to sh showcase their leadership. They are still women. Women with disabilities, for example, despite a lot of efforts in our party, for example, women who are vying were paying half the amount. Young people, uh, young people had been given a 65% waiver. Uh, women with disabilities and all people with disabilities were not paying anything to buy to buy our our uh, via our ticket, but yet we could also see that uh, the when we just unpack, you'll see that women with disabilities are not as many as we'd expect. Young women are coming to me and they are telling me, you know, now in my village I'm being told I should buy for an MCA. I think there is that perception that the younger you are, the smaller seat you deserve, mm. and then you grow yeah, now. Wait, yeah, yeah. I remember two ladies, very quite interesting ladies, they were telling me, now people are telling me to buy for MCA. Um, I think the tag of Mama County looks like a mama. So I'm telling them, you go tell them <laughs> Utakua Auntie Wa County or Cousin Wa County. <laughs> that said, I think there was a very significant moment, uh, event that happened uh, barely one month ago when Baba elected or rather Baba chose or it was decided that Baba's running mate would be Martha. Yeah. And I think that speaks to affirmative action because of the excitement her ticket brought to the political landscape and what that means for more women now moving forward. Because this is the first time in the history of our country where we've had a woman running mate in the, who is a running mate of the two horses, as they are called, who is likely actually to, you know, to the, the two horses, and it's almost, you can tell that it's either this or this one who will win. So then um, I remember mother said, it's not if we will win, it's when we will win. So I think some of these significant political events will also now try to push, because I think come 2027, it will be very hard for people to tell women, you go and vote for that small seat, because a woman will have, demonstrated leadership really and when you look now at the ticket for example in our party we've seen around uh, where we are having gubernatorial aspirants eight of them have chosen women we have senators who are 12 we have mps who are 75 we've got 35 women reps in places where we have you know we have put our candidates yeah. that tells us something that in the first parliament i believe uh, we didn't have any woman in the senate 
in the second one, the one that is ongoing, I believe we have three women. Yeah. And now in our party, we have eight, who are, uh, 12 who want to buy an hour ticket. In her party, I believe there are women in the same, and in even other parties. That tells us something that whichever political affiliation these women will be coming from, in the next Senate, there will be more women. Affirmative action uh, is, a, is, is also really com comes from our cultural persuasions, where you're finding that most communities, and really it's the issue of gender, most, uh, gender is a societal construction, how people perceive the, the roles of men and women in society. In Kenya, Though we are trying to get out of that and some of these significant political events are helping, women's role and participation really is seen in the private life, in the home. Women are homemakers, Proverbs 31, wife material. You can see those, <laughs> those memes that are on social media. Right. So people are yet to acclimatize to the fact that we'll also have, now we want women in public leadership. Because we are asking, so how come the women are so good when they are doing the private leadership in the community? They are the many community health workers. They are the many people who are doing the private leadership. But when they want to lead in the public, they are not good. So how come they are good on this side? Where there's a lot even of labor, we can even start talking about their contribution and unpaid care work. But when they want to come to the public, there's resistance. So affirmative action, is a complementary to the other efforts that are, that are really done, not only in the political leadership, but in the economic leadership, in leadership of schools, in leadership of churches, because I feel like affirmative action is also reflected in other facets of our society. Yeah. So affirmative action is good. It protects. Uh, to that is an issue really. Uh, there has been a lot of court cases anyway. Even that to that, to we, that. Yeah, we are yeah. yet to meet that, and especially in parliament. Uh, so me for me it's beautiful and it should be encouraged alongside other ways of getting more women in leadership and you know i have to ask because hearing soipan and wanja uh, in terms of the seats that have been allocated to women to vie for various positions mm -hmm. um we've seen martha karua and we are calling it the martha effect is this the moment and the season for women candidates or are we seeing a political trend mm -hmm. you know what are you reading in this time um, thanks, Vicky. Um, allow me to start in 2017. After the election, FIDA Kenya and NDI did a gender audit. Yeah. A gender audit where we wanted to see what did we get right and what is still a work in progress. And a lot of it had to do with the political parties. It was without a doubt that indeed uh, women uh, issues have come of age. Uh, we were very confident. We knew from 2017 coming to 2022, the women question was definitely going to take center stage. The question is, well, are we able to have the nexus between the women question and what women have been clamoring for mm -hmm. over time? And so uh, for us to see that, especially the, both the leading uh, I'd say the leading political outfits have women at their center stage, whether it's a choice of a female running mate or having a, a clear or a public women's charter. Uh, for us, that signals the progress that we have attained to date. However, a lot still needs to be done and allow me to single out the two thirds gender rule. The two thirds gender rule sadly has been christened as this burden something that Kenya is making so much progress, but oh, there's this thing that we are yet to attain, which is really unfortunate because, again, coming out of 2017, some of the recommendations we made, we actually saw fruition in them. We saw for the first time the ORPP, the IBC, being very clear in terms of the two-thirds gender rule. The ORPP herself did send back a number of parties for compliance to be able to show the constitution of the membership is two-thirds. In terms of IBC, the chairperson, Mr. Chebukati, was very clear from the beginning that parties need to comply. Yeah. And so when we had the litigation taking place, especially now post-clearance of this 2022 season, uh, what was interesting is that we had a, number, a good number of parties who complied. So it's largely, I think, the bigger parties who had a challenge complying, which again goes back to the questions of how they carried out nominations. And for, for this, for example, um, in terms of the process, and I know Mweshimua has mentioned, yeah. and she knows I have publicly raised it, that I personally wanted to see her on the ballot, because at the end of the day, the consensus building, the boardroom negotiations, you know who the power barons are. But especially when we have quality leadership, 
quality leadership that we've seen, which really has a bearing on the livelihoods of people. I've been, I'll single out again, Narok. I've been to Narok. I've attended a function that Mwishimua uh, Soipan was there that really speaks to the core issues that we are battling as a country, the question of FGM a question that even the head of state himself really made a pledge to try and eliminate it by 2022. So for us, it's not so much that we want to see Honorable Soipan as a gubernatorial candidate. It's the clamor and the consistency she's brought, especially on an issue like that. Mm -hmm. How much more if we have women who understand what that means to be able to be in a place where her job description speaks about issues of legislation and really affecting how counties run because this is a key issue in the area. So for us, where we stand is we want, yes, to see the progress, and we've seen it. We have a female uh, deputy running mate in a major party. We have a women's charter. But where the rubber will meet the road is post-election. We will want ways to hold whoever will be in office to account. And even those who will not make it, there'll still be a major political play in this country. What measures will they put in place, for example, to push for actualization of the two-thirds? And the two-thirds is important to be key in this regard. We've seen, especially as has been mentioned, the affirmative action seats serve as a springboard. Mm. We have seen very good examples. Allow me to mention people like uh, Honorable Amelia, Honorable Cecilia Mbariri, Honorable Mishimbok, Honorable Aisha Juma, who first came in as uh, affirmative action members and they were able to transit to mixed gender seats. And now they're even going for bigger seats. So that's the element of progression, that because we are not able to guarantee women that space at the ballot, uh, avoid, uh, avoiding uh, issues such as violence that often deter them, misinformation, disinformation, especially on social media, that if we have affirmative action, then we'll have strong women coming in, being able to leverage on the political space, and eventually they vie for higher seats. So. In this election, as you rightfully said, the women are center stage, but we are not celebrating yet. We we'll want to see, will that translate mm. in the livelihoods of women? Because we need to remember, we are not just pushing for numbers for the sake of it. There's a whole reason why. There's a whole history of how women and girls in this country have undergone various elements of discrimination. We still have femicide as a major catastrophe in this country, aspects of GPV, aspects of defilement and rape, discrimination, at workplaces, we want to see that translate into better legislation. And it is not to say that men cannot, but women understand the issues better. So even for the women who are vying for office, under the umbrella and the promise they'll make life better for fellow women and girls, we'll want to hold them to account. Mm. But once you have the opportunity to make change, how have you used that? Because it should translate in better safe spaces for women and girls, better legislation. We should have the reality of having zero rated dignity parks, for example, and safe spaces that we keep on being promised. So that's the history so that Kenyans are not lost in the question of we just want to see women. There is a reason why more women in legislation and has been proven through research right. when they are backed up and they have a clear agenda it translates in better lives so, so it has the win has to go beyond august tonight yes mm -hmm. yeah. absolutely mm -hmm. um you know let me, let's talk about money um honorable soipan and I, I came across this um study called the cost of politics and it was looking at 2017 and just how female and male politicians fared and it, it said women outspent men in all elective posts except the senate in 2017 and they looked at the amount that women spent on average for national assembly seats it was 23.6 million while their male counterparts spent 17 million but when you looked at the electability only 18 percent of women who contested were elected you know, so the money did not translate into <laughs> a better chance of getting into office. So, so talk us through this whole aspect of money and how it is a serious barrier for, for women politicians. I would say that uh, <clears throat> our, our electorate, our, uh, you know, electoral processes, uh, the Kenyan voter, we have a long way to go. Mm -hmm. Uh, first of all, because um, as a legislator, as a member of parliament, when you look at the expectations that are leveled against me by my voters, totally removed from my constitutional role, 
as a member of parliament. And uh, a lot of it goes into uh, the aspect about, uh, you know, um, w what is the quick gain that somebody is getting from a politician. And, and un until we crack that, uh, we have a long, long way to go. And I think uh, it, it, it all uh, is, is blanketed in the whole issue about, uh, I think corruption also has a role to play in this. Because, uh, you know, instead of somebody looking at me and saying what it is they can get uh, from me as a leader, you know, not even as a woman leader, as a leader, what, what do I have to offer this voter that I'm soliciting uh, votes from? They want to say what it is I can give them here and now, mm. you know. And so if you don't have uh, money, <laughs> you're going nowhere in our political space at is, as it is right now. And it is very unfortunate. Um, allow me to delve into what uh, um, my colleagues here have started talking about in terms of what, are we making any headway? Mm. Are we not? And I think uh, as a women of Kenya, we have learned a lot of lessons. Those of us who have run in office, those who are in different fields, we have a role to play in order to, you know, to crack this uh, two-third gender and having women in, in the leadership space. We have been very strategic as uh, women in the Kenya Kwanzaa Alliance. We are yet to have our manifesto uh, launched, the, the general manifesto for the Kenya Kwanzaa Al Alliance. But we have had a chance where our party leader, William Ruto, we have sat him down and have said, this time round, we do not want to sit and wait to appear in a paragraph of the party manifesto. We want a distinct, clear statement of what it is the Kenya Kwanzaa Alliance is promising our women. And for those of you who saw, we had our launch of the charter uh, on Friday. And he has, the, the, William Ruto has appended his signature to this charter, which has a whole array of uh, things and statements that we are committing him to, you know, to, to, and we will put him to account. And you will realize that he has signed to it and uh, his second term in office will depend on that because if he doesn't uh, live to that promise, then we will have issues. We, we started, yesterday we started a rollout of our charter to yeah. take it down to the counties. We were in Moranga County, Kirinyaga County, and the women are already reciting the charter. So William Bruto is aware that the women of Kenya are looking up to him and will put him to account after nine. And I agree with you. Um, that is where the, 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 the tire meets the tarmac, after the ninth. I want to say something about, uh, you know, for a long time, I think we have not been strategic because we should be requesting for these things before the election. Mm. Because only then can you tell somebody, this is what you said, can you live up to this? And as Kenya Kwanzaa Alliance women, we are saying, we would want William Bruto, once he's president, in every of his state of the nation address to parliament, he should give us uh, a statement about what he is doing in terms of realizing the charter that he has signed with the women of Kenya. Because we have come to realize that, you know, every time a new government comes into, pl into place, yes, we have women uh, picked to cabinet, but it's not enough. Because we have, a, we have a gender ministry, for example, headed by very powerful women right now. But we still have a girl in Bomet killing herself because of this, uh, you know, period poverty, you know, uh, the stereotyping and the, and the whole uh, challenges about the, the, you know, lack of sanitary towels. If it was enough that we just have women planted in cabinet positions, then we would, we would not have problems. But we are saying there's a, a bigger problem, and the bigger problem is let us have our presidential candidates commit just beyond picking a woman to head a, a, a position or to become a, you know, a, a running mate. Above that, let us have clear statements of commitment mm -hmm. like what William Ruto has shown. I am confident that after the ninth, there is, there is no hiding for, for His Excellency William Bruto. He has to live up to the charter that uh, he has uh, signed with the women of Kenya. We have a whole uh, agency, the Women's Rights Agency, to deal with all the issues that um, um, uh, my, my friend here is talking about, about sexual and gender-based violence. And we have said, 
beyond the anti-FGM board, which we have now, has no money whatsoever. They just deal with boardroom meetings when girls are killing themselves in Bomet and Narok and other places because of all this uh, sexual abuse. We want a whole agency tied to the office of the president beside a ministry for gender so that we, we cannot have stories of, you know, we don't have enough money to, 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 to deal with the sexual and gender-based violence issues. So I think that uh, as, as the women of Kenya, we have learned our lessons and I know this time round we are going to nail it because we have even committed uh, William Ruto to say that within three months of his coming into office, yeah. we have to establish a mechanism for implementation of the two-third. And within 12 months, we should have that in place. Okay, that yeah. remains to be seen. And I guess that kind of takes a lot of these positions and appointments of women beyond tokenism yeah. uh, and translating into the benefit of uh, the women electorate. Um, but let me come to you, Anja, in terms of something you mentioned earlier and, and just how women in leadership is viewed. Um, women traditionally or culturally, as you said, are seen best fit in the home or in the community. And, and those roles are kind of limited to where they can um, express themselves in leadership. When you look at, uh, at how they cross over into politics, though, and, and the fact that women campaign very differently from men, um, they're not necessarily going to be in the big rallies. Um, if they are, at, at times, it could be reduced to a soundbite here and there. But, but women are very intentional. They have more direct forms of campaigning, small focus groups, more door-to-door, face-to-face meetings. But how does this impact their campaigning? Uh, the fact that they would engage very differently from their male counterparts who are used to bigger, uh, grand engagements with the electorate. Um, um when it comes to wooing the voters, or Wanjiko, as she's called, or he's called, as the voter is called, really, I think the, the styles are different, the tactics are different. Yeah. But um, you've talked about women's contribution being reduced to sound bites. Therefore, that speaks also to the media and the amount of airtime that they give women candidates. Uh, that said, there are some electoral vices that should be dealt with seriously mm. to ensure that women are more out, outside there. For example, um, issues of violence, issues of intimidation. Some of the women candidates will maybe avoid a certain place, not because they don't want to be there, not because they have nothing to say. It's just because issues like electoral violence, embarrassment, beating. We've even had stories of women who came before us who have even said that there is a time someone pulled their hair, for example. So there's that aspect of there are being very seri serious laws that protect women candidates, women journalists, for example, women who are participating in the, in, in the political process. That said, we've seen, and Moshima Soipan has talked about Kenya Kwanza and what they are doing. Uh, considering that I'm on the, in the other side of, um, mm -hmm. of, the, of the political divide, as a male, uh, when we had our female and our leader, you, you know, we hope that a day will come where we won't say female vice president, we'll just say vice, vice president yeah, or deputy yeah. president. She talked about we've gotten to a point where we've crossed the Rubicon. That's, those are her, her exact words. She also now, you know, talked about the journey that has been, how they have been in the trenches with Baba and what, what have you. Um, this country, and um, when I saw the women chatter by, by, by our friends, we have always tried to in reinvent the wheel all the time. We've always tried to rewrite and write and rewrite. Uh, I'm of the view that if only we integrate women in all government programs, as it were. And that's why uh, I, I was happy with our manifesto where we are talking about women in health, women in manufacturing. Basically what we are saying is we are integrating women in the ongoing activities, for example. This country has a lot of laws that protect women. For example, issues around, let's say, for example, women agency, as our friends wanted to put it. But we have a, a full-fledged ministry that caters to women issues. We also have very unique laws. For example, we have the Prevention Against Domestic Violence. I believe it's 2015, if I'm not wrong. Or is it 2011? 15. 2015. We have the Sexual Offenses Act, where we know that most of the people who are violated uh, women and most of the poor violate are men. Research has shown us that. We have um, many other legal instruments that really what remains 
is just goodwill to implement what we have. Because the moment we keep on rewriting and reinventing and reinventing, we shall be doing a lot of uh, registration, uh, we shall be doing a lot of repetition, we shall be doing another whole set of consultation. Now we have decided to have this, let's do the whole country, let's do public participation. We really don't have time because these gender issues and these women issues really are coming with a lot of urgency. It, it is urgent. Having women in seats of, uh, in political seats, having women in cabinet, having women in schools, it is an urgent issue. Um, if you look at the happenings as we, uh, as we head towards um, 20, 2022, uh, it's really about implementation of what we already have because our, our laws are beautiful. But you've talked about money, uh, Victoria. One of the uh, one of the things that I, I sort of agree with my friends here is some of the practical steps by leaders of politics before the election, before pre-election. When you look at, for example, the women charter that, that they did, uh, while maybe we might want to make fun of it, it was a good step in this way that they are trying to take their political divide and hold their leader to account. When we look at our manifesto, which I'm now defending, it's beautiful because we are integrating women in activities. But some of the other pre-activities that I noticed were, were different, for example, from our side, is just when we said women will pay less. Because issues of women and money even start with ability to pay for the nomination fees, ability to travel from all the way to come to Nairobi, for example, right. ability to uh, to do a lot of paperwork and a lot of printing and a lot of go, come back, go, come back. So one of the beautiful things on our side that we did really was to make the process as simple as, as, simple as possible. And they appreciated really. In fact, I remember one of the ladies saw our document, the nomination document, and she asked me, is this all? Because she expected something very abstract. Uh, so those are the, the, the practical steps really. But I also now moving into the future, Women are not homogenous in this country. Women have always been seen to be this particular group of women. So when people say, what about the girls? We are assuming that your average girl is the Nairobi girl, with, and the Nairobi girl is also good, who has a lot of advantages. Yeah. But this country is very big. So as we are now holding our leaders into account, as we are now starting to look at the practical way forward, we are asking, where are the young women in this equation? Where are the women with disabilities in this equation? Where are the women from tribal, uh, marginalized community in this equation? Yeah. Where are the women from Ma community and pastoral community in this equation? Because we can as well start saying that we are fighting discrimination, but within uh, ourselves, we are not also seeing that we could also be promoting uh, discrimination by not having the mosaic nature and the diversity of women in leadership. And I think that's what the future looks like. Yeah, yeah you know, and um, Wanjaz just mentioned that women are not homogenous, you know. Absolutely. And, and when you're looking at, there's always this idea that we have every election cycle, do women vote as a block? You know, especially when you're looking at who do we campaign to? Mm -hmm. And and I know that um, you had a campaign that started last year, Vote Adada campaign. Yes. Um, and, and what that seeks to do, who are you speaking to mm -hmm. and, and why are you pushing this agenda now? Okay. Uh, thank you, Vicky. So the FIDA Kenya Vote Adada campaign is uh, our initiative to be bold and unapologetic about backing any girl who's above 18 because you have to vie for office <laughs> when you're above 18. Mm -hmm. Whether you're from a marginalized community, a minority community, a mainstream community, it is nonpartisan. And you were very clear about it from the beginning. For us, the agenda is we want to see more women in strategic positions who we can propel to be able to get into office and be able to make a difference. So when we started the campaign, I'll give the example, actually in 20. Uh, in August of 2021, uh, Honorable Martha Caro is actually the one who flagged it off. Mm -hmm. And at that time, she had not declared that uh, we didn't know how the, the story would change. But at the same meeting we had her, we had women from uh, ODM party, from UDA party, from every other, even the smaller parties, including women who are declared, I am non-partisan, I'm independent. And for us, that's the beauty of the vote, Adada. We are calling upon any woman and we are supporting all of them, those in political parties, as well as the independent candidates, because we'll have a number of independent women candidates. And the idea is that we should be able, as a country, to give them a level playing field. And we know aspects as uh, 
have been mentioned, one, uh, electoral violence and a lot of shaming and singling out women candidates, especially on social media, is often witnessed. That has to be dealt with. We have questions of money, and so we were able then to even speak to political parties, the IBC, to see how they can give women who we know historically have more challenges to be able to have a more level playing field. Okay. Interestingly, we were never worried about... Um, things such as qualifications. Because, you know, women, even if you decide today I want to run to be a member of county assembly, I can assure you those women are well prepared. Mm -hmm. They've thought through their campaign because you have to prepare twice or thrice as hard as a gentleman to be able to vie for office. So for us, it was more to deal especially with the historical challenges. So one, finances, to be able to make them think beyond the box so we are not able to give you money as feeder, but there's innovation around how you can run your campaign. Two, compliance. We know the ORPP, the IBC, have very stringent uh, guidelines and regulations, so debunking this to them. Then getting closer to the nominations, the question of electoral dispute resolution. We know usually that's very complex, both at the nomination stage and at the election stage, we'll have a number of petitions, so we were able to reach out to pro bono lawyers who we have trained who are able to specifically give election dispute resolution assistance to women who need the same. But we are also trying to learn as a country. Yeah. If you look at the 2017 Kenya National Commission on Human Rights Report on police brutality, the elements of SGBV came out as, as, it was not deliberate, it was something that they came across and that caught the attention of the nation that as we monitor what happens, especially in the pre- and post-election scenario, we must be able to also keep tabs of how vulnerable groups, especially women, are affected. So for this time round, for the, as a first-time initiative, FIDA has deployed SGBV monitors across the country mm -hmm. who we have trained, who will help us document every step of this electoral cycle for purposes of us learning as a country. What makes women uh, exceptionally vulnerable? What what are the trends we are seeing in terms of the violations they are facing? So with the 100 monitors we have right now, as part of the campaign, we are hoping that come September we are able to give the country a report right. that is comprehensive, that speaks to what we have seen for purposes of learning, remembering that Victoria elections is a cycle. Yeah, so we are hoping that through the capacity building, the provision of legal assistance and the monitoring, collectively, uh, the voter data campaign, we hope that we'll be able to be able to have good lessons, to have more numbers. And from what you're seeing, we are very confident. If we are able to have clear, credible elections, the IBC is able to do what it needs to do at this last stage of the home stretch to be able to have clear provision of how voting should be done, civic education, women will be able to come out. And it's interesting you question that um, uh, uh, do women vote as a block? Mm. I think for us the rallying call has been if a lady offers herself for office, uh, look really question what has she been able to do we are also pushing at the end of the day for leaders it's not just men or women it's credible leaders yeah. leaders of integrity leaders with a track record so be able to assess this woman don't dismiss her or don't just give her the vote because she's a woman what's her track record and for you to assess that you must give her an equal opportunity to sell her campaign yeah. and that's where for us we really celebrate and has been mentioned, women campaign differently. And actually that is more qualitative campaigning because a woman knows she may not score much with the large crowds, it's also very hostile, but she'll sit down with smaller groups, the town hall sessions, be able to understand what are the complexities of that society? What do both men and women want? What are the questions of security, infrastructure? And that translates in better leadership. Women have been at the forefront, for example, in gender responsive budgeting we have spoken to women and communities when the budgets are brought to us what do we need to look for and how do we hold to account those who are tasked with the finances to see you said you'll build this cattle dip you'll sink a borehole in this corner of the county you'll build better roads has this translated how much money was spent because sadly for us as a country most of the time victoria we focus at the national level forgetting that 
the person who influences you the most starts with your member of country assembly, your member of parliament, and your governor in place. So we need to have more investment at that level. And even as we get into the last 50 or something days to the election, let's not just focus on the presidential elections. There's more that will affect us as a country. And the more we have better quality leaders starting at the, at the, at the very basic level, the better we'll be able to hold to account, even those who'll be at the highest office. And I think the ground has shifted. What we celebrate is for a lot of Kenyans now they invested, they're like, okay, fine, maybe I've made up my mind on who I'll vote for as president. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to where I live, mm -hmm. don't tell me who to vote for. And that, I think, is a kind of political education we need to consistently have, even beyond 9th of August, that they need to be very careful to scrutinize who's your county assembly member, who's the chairman of the CDF committee, who's your member of parliament, because those are the people who will directly affect your lives and that of your family. And the more we do that, the better it will be for us, and it will be easier than to have that scrutiny at the highest level, yeah. even if you're a popular candidate candidate as a president, you still have to account to us as a nation what you've been able to do for us. Absolutely. And we have a few minutes to go before we wrap up um, this discussion. And I just want to kind of get from all of you um, just your thoughts on how we begin to prime the electorate. So it's one thing, yes, political parties have fronted their candidates and say, this is the person we want. But when you're looking at the case for women, uh, you have to convince the voter on the ground, you know, and, and when the ball is in the court of the voter, that will be August 9th. Will they have been convinced enough by that time that yes, because remember, when you're dealing with women candidates, there's the big C, which I like to call culture. There's still a very big factor on the ground, you know. So when you're taking that into account, when speaking to the electorate, when, when trying to convince them, change their minds that this woman leader is the best choice. What is being said? What activities are happening within that space to engage them effectively? And I'll start with you, Honorable Soip. Yeah, you know, um, like I said, uh, having been in office for those 10 years, um, the goalposts for women is a totally different thing. I started off as a young and married woman. Mm -hmm. They said we cannot elect this woman because she will take our seat and get married to somebody out of this county. When I got married, when I got into office, they said, now look at this one. We elected her to go and get a husband in parliament. <laughs> I got my babies in parliament, it was a problem. So I think uh, women, we should be focused. We should not be distracted by all these uh, attacks leveled against women. We should focus on that qualitative campaign. I believe women are the ones to change this country. Because when you look at how women are campaigning, I am one of them, I have seen other women campaign. They really focus on the real issues that uh, touch the hearts of the people. Yeah. And if only the, the environment could be con conducive, you know, give women given the space to exercise their leadership uh, abilities and to express themselves, we will change this country. Because uh, for women candidates, we, we know that uh, you cannot buy the vote. Because you have rightly put it, the, the statistics that you've uh, read out, in as much as you're spending that money, people still go beyond that to say this is a woman. It's not a, how, how much you have. And we are not even good at buying votes. I mean, we, we are good at selling the agenda and trying to touch the heart of the, of the voter to be able to. Um, vote you in because of what you're offering. So I think um, we should we should keep the focus. And like uh, my sister Wanja here says that uh, we we seem to be reinventing the wheel. We have to keep pushing until it happens. And uh, for me, the biggest uh, achievement right now is that we are having this solid conversations before the election, because only then will we have a platform to say, look, this is what we agreed on. And uh, you know this is this is what uh, the leadership agreed to, and we are putting you to account on it. And we need to shift again. I have to emphasize, from being happy with tokenism, just because we've been put in an office and you say that is enough, it is not enough. I be, I, I agree. We have the laws, we have the institutions in place, but now we have to be more strategic. And uh, you know, for my alliance. We, we, ha we are strategic enough, and I, I can tell uh, Anne, I mean, the kind of things you've been trying to work hard on, the only thing you'll have to do after 9th mm -hmm. 
is to follow William Bruto with, this, with our charter and say, this is what you said you'll do for the women. Mm -hmm. So we have set it out for, for Kenyan, the Kenyan women. We have set it out for our um, civil society organizations to rally up around this. And it's not just enough to say, we have a woman deputy president, we have a woman cabinet secretary. It's the issues and how we, we come to realize uh, the implementation of these things. And for the civil society organizations, I think you, we, you also need to move away from just uh, offering technical assistance. Come and support these women with, with tangible funding for them to be able to push the envelope right down there because without that, then uh, they, they still get disadvantaged yeah. in their campaigns. Wanja? Uh, okay, all right. Uh, really, uh, about the civil society, although Annie is also our friend, I think also, I've also noticed uh, as we move into the future, really, they should also try and not work in silos. I remember some of my peers, when I invite them for meetings, I tell them, go for this training. They're like, but I went even for another one, the same. Mm -hmm. Like uh, some have been reciting IBC rules and regulation at the top of their head because they have been taught by five different <laughs> angels. So they're telling me now, oh, what if they do this? So I think that it presents a room for even civil society to co-create programs for women in different areas where, for example, in maybe in a place uh, like, for example, a community that the cultural aspect is very strong, they can co-create programs really addressing issues around culture. That said, when we had our candidate uh, in our coalition, we are now saying like Kamara Harris, like Martha, that's what we are riding on with. And we saw that our candidates are excited a lot, uh, excited the political landscape in such a huge way it was the real earthquake, such that the, not the other funny earthquake, this one was the real one, such that even the, these people who are doing polling, the numbers started tilting in a very, you could see the changes. Probably it, um, that, it, some of us felt like that was the reason why there was a reactionary move by our friends to have a women charter. But that said, if the, at the apex of this country, there is a woman who will be deput uh, who will be deputizing a presidential candidate. Then Wanjuko, the voter, should not have any doubt about the women. If there is a woman who is entrusted at the apex, that woman can be entrusted at the Senate, at the Parliament, at the County Assembly, and so on and so forth. They say that um, women hold half half the sky. It means that women really, and in this country, women are like 50% really. So if the 50% of the people are there with you, women live in society, they're in our markets, they're in our places, uh, I just urge the voter, I wish to prime the voter and urge the voter, that when you see two people who are competing, men and women, at the very least, judge them by how they are talking, judge them by what they are presenting. But as Anne has said, women are also very good at gender sensitive budgeting and budgeting for issues. Uh, one of my mentors, Priscilla Nyokabi, who is vying in Yeri, she was telling us that when we have men, for example, when we implemented the last mile electricity co connectivity project in Kenya, if there were more women in that table, probably we would, we would have implemented last water drop uh, in every home project in this country because women know the challenges of water and sanitation. So women are seen to, they gravitate towards issues around health, very important water, sanitation, women protection. And the beauty of women is that women are, love both boys and girls, both men and male and women. So there has also been this funny retaliatory remarks that I see, why women, where is the boy, where is the boy? Having more women in leadership is not in any way antagonizing or taking away the men from the leadership. Yeah. We can complement each other. Women have proven to be very good leaders. You've seen Moshmoa Soipan who, has, who was even able to aspire for a very big seat. You've seen Joki Dongo who passed a very progressive and probably the most unique law in this country, the Sexual Offenses Act. We've seen, uh, uh, you know, the Sicily Barides, for example. We've seen very many women, Laboso, we have seen a lot of women who have now, uh, in Yokabi, who passed the NGAF, National Government Affirmative Action. So the women's contribution in this country is a lot, yeah. but also to pass the ball to my to women. I urge the women who are vying and those who aspire to vie even in 2027 to also document and not shy away from uh, their achievements. Because okay. women are also very good, but sometimes they don't show their achievements. We have a minute to go, so let me hand over to Anne for the last word. Um, thank you, Vicky. I think for me, 
two strong things. One, the ground has shifted. Uh, in 2021, when we had our first female chief justice in office, we never imagined we could have a female chief justice and a female deputy chief justice, but that has happened. But beyond the two of them being in office, beyond them being exemplary judges of the Supreme Court, the institution of the judiciary is doing quite well. If you look at their manifesto, if you look at what she pledged in her 100 days, the judiciary has really transformed. And so why I single that out is because for this election, as has been said by my sisters, women are at the heart of it. Women as candidates, but also women as voters. And why is this important? It's important because we are also in a very definitive point of our nation. The issues that Kenyans are facing Victoria are bread and butter issues. Away from the grandois infrastructure and development, Kenyans are sleeping hungry. We don't have children in school. The cost of living has gone really high. Fuel prices, as we can see, are really skyrocketed. And for us to make the lives of Kenyans worthwhile, we will need leaders who understand what it means to have three children at home and you're not able to cater for them. What it means that we think beyond the job descriptions that we often tell our youth, go and look for jobs, start a business, but that's not working. We need to really think through as a nation for this youth group of ours that is really unemployed, desperate, really being easy bait for gangs and, and all these other uh, illegal groups. What do we do? And for us to have that, then we'll need to have leaders who are credible, who have the integrity, who have the track record of being transformative. And Kenyans are faced with a choice of exemplary men and women but women especially, who for this time round have presented themselves across the board. So what we urge Kenyans is don't judge the candidates because they're women only. Listen to what they have to say. Listen to what their manifesto speaks to you as a family, to you as an individual, to you as a community. And beyond the elections, don't forget that there will still be the accountability. Right. So please follow them through. If they get in, be able to follow through and ask them, this is what you pledge, what are you going to do? But finally, for the women leaders, because women leadership is not just in elections, my hope, and uh, for those who even will not be on the ballot, like Honorable Soipan, is that with her exemplary leadership, there's still a place it can fit in. There's a lot that women can do. So for the women who will, are presenting themselves, we celebrate them. For those who will go through, we congratulate them in advance. But those who will not, there are still a lot of spaces and spheres of influence that our country needs you to plug into. So please look for a space. Start where you are. Look at the issues that you are very passionate about. Don't relent in your quest to really amplify them because collectively, that is what will make Kenya better. We need to move from the desperation we are seeing in a lot of young people, in a lot of rural families, in a lot of urban families. Life in Nairobi is just beyond affordability for us to get to a place where we are all then can say life, yes, really makes it worthwhile for us to be there. So for us, we look forward to that. A civil society will keep doing our best, but again, Remember, civil society organizations are 100% donor funded. So as we move towards progression as a country, it means even the ability for us to fundraise, we are now classified as a middle income country. That has complexities and whatever is happening around the world. So my appeal is for us who are local and Kenyans have a lot of resources, especially the corporates plug into community-based organizations and civil society organizations that you feel make a difference yeah. because that is a resourcing that will be able to help Kenya. And Victoria, if we talk about a country where our head of state, His Excellency, has stated that we lose two billion every day in corruption, how much more would this money help, especially towards water, towards sanitation, towards creating safe spaces for vulnerable groups? So we need to get serious as a country and look at the connection. Corruption does not just affect us in one way. Mm -hmm. There's so many ways that that money that is lost through corruption can come back to our communities, make better schools, make affordable roads, make better water points that eventually we all celebrate as a country. Mm -hmm. So we're excited about the 9th of August and we hope that in this build-up to the last days, let's not have violence against anyone 
against anyone. Let's have sanitized politics, sell your manifesto for Kenyans who are going to listen to the politicians, listen to them, go home, make your choice. It's a secret ballot and we wait to see what the IBC has prepared on the 9th of August. All right. Thank As you. we are hurtling to that date, August 9th, thank you so much, Honorable Soipan Wanja and Anne for your insights and continue the conversation on social media as well. I can see quite a few of your tweets coming in. The hashtag is Daybreak Bob Owino. You say, why are women pushing for a gender card yet that came up with the narrative what a man can do, a woman can do better? <laughs> why don't they fight for their space like men? Well, we've discussed that extensively yeah. through this morning. Um, another one here from Anthony Khan saying chatters, promises, or agenda does not really matter. Um, this was a question about what Azimio Coalition and Kenya Kwanzaa were really committing to uh, when it comes to Kenyans' needs. And we talked about that as well. I hope that was answered, Anthony. Um, Frank Orinda saying the gender card will be a big impact in the upcoming election. So let's see if that actually translates uh, come August 10th, the day after election day. Mm. Gender is so an agenda. Gender is an agenda. Yes. Thank you so much. <laughs> Have a lovely morning. We will leave you, uh, after the break that is, with Level Up Friday, DJ T-Boy and Shutterboy standing by. Stay tuned. Thank you so much for staying with us up until this point. Bye for now.